of creatures appearing suddenly and fully formed. There's no transitional links as they try to say. The major animal groups appear in the fossil record full-blown and raring to go. That is cited in Icons of Evolution, Jeffrey Schwartz. David Ropp and Stephen Stanley are evolutionists, and they say commonly new higher categories appear abruptly in the fossil record without evidence of transitional form. So how come we have the new higher categories show up and there's never, we don't find the transitional form, uh, forms that are supposedly supposed to be there? Maybe because they don't exist. Stephen Jay Gould, an evolutionist, a species does not arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. He believes in evolution and this is what he's saying. They don't arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. Everything it needs, it's already there for it. <clears throat> the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian layer is named after rocks in Cambria, Wales. This layer is supposed to be 500 to 600 million years old and to represent the beginning of life. The Cambrian is at the beginning of the Paleozoic era. It's down there at the bottom. So this is where life started, so they say. They call it the Cambrian Explosion because a huge variety of fossil creatures appear in these rock layers fully formed. Spiders, they appear fully formed. There's supposed to be a picture there, but I think <clears throat> um, when I put it to Apple, it, it lost it. So there are even fossilized spider webs with bugs caught on them. Trilobites, they appear fully formed as well. Bats, they just show up. Dr. Gary Morgan from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History. The pterosaurs, when the pterosaurs first appear in the geological record, they were completely perfect. There's no transition to that. They just show up. There they are. <clears throat> That's from Jura Museum in Germany. Pterosaurs were flying reptiles that are now extinct. I'm glad those are extinct. Aren't you? <laughs> those look like they could probably carry one of us off. I'm glad they're not there anymore. Missing from the fossil record of the millions of years of slow development, from the supposed first simple life form below the Cambrian layer. So there's millions of years of, of slow development from the simple life form to today. Where is all of that? Where are all the transitional creatures that are supposed to be there? Number four, the fossil record shows complexity from its earliest layers. Remember, they say we started off very simple down there at the bottom, right? Simple celled organism is how it all kicked off. And then it grew more complex from that. Okay. But the fossil record shows complexity from the very beginning, even in that, you know, supposed simple cell, it's very complex. According to evolution, life arose from a simple one-celled creature and developed into even higher life forms, but this is not what the fossil record shows. So, I mean, look at this. Where does it have, like, mankind coming from? Fish. If you follow it up the left, we're, we come from fish. Okay. <clears throat> creatures appear with complex features right from the get-go the bat the oldest bats had the ability to fly in to detect insects with echolocation organs oldest bats we have they still do that today the oldest ones we know of, that's how they came fully formed and complete the trilobite its eyes which had uh, 15,000 lenses in some species has never been exceeded for complexity there's a fossil of one right there, and you can see its eyes. There's no such thing as a simple creature. Microbiology has taught us this. A bacterium is more complex than a modern city. So even though it's, it's super small and we can't see without microscopes, now that we have microscopes more powerful to be able to see what's going on, we know it's more complex than a modern city. Even plant life is extremely complex. Consider plant math. The plant is constantly monitoring the light and performing complex calculations in order to ration its store of starch until the sun reappears. <clears throat> Just thinking about math even, um, however far you went in school with math and how complex it started to get, do you remember when you were getting taught new things in math and you're like, wow, who figured this out, right? You're like, I don't know who figured this out. And then think about the math beyond what you actually know and that we've figured out and we can you know, figure things out because of math. And God put all of this together. And for us, it may take some serious brain power to try and learn it and understand it. Yet for God, it's nothing. This is how much higher his ways are than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. It's something as simple as math. But this plant is constantly monitoring the light and performing 
calculations in order to ration its store of starch until the sun reappears. If the starch store is used too fast, plants will starve and stop growing during the night. If the store is used too slowly, some of it will be wasted. And that's Dr. Allison Smith, metabolic biologist. These plants do math from June of 2013. At the John Eines Center in Norwich, researchers studied the Arbidopsis, a small flowering plant of the mustard family. They attempted to trick the plants by changing light conditions, introducing windows of sunlight during the night, etc. But the plants adapted in every situation. It is obvious that the starch balance and light conditions are being monitored continually and recomputed according to the condition. Consider plant communication. Plants can detect sounds of insects eating them. The caterpillar of the cabbage butterfly starts eating a Arabidopsis plant. Here's danger aloud with the cup. Scientists at the University of Missouri recently discovered that this tiny muscle plant creates chemical defenses in response to the chewing vibrations of this predator. They used specialized lasers to detect these vibrations. My part of the collaboration involves recording the tiny vibrations produced by the caterpillars as they're feeding analyzing those and reproducing them, playing them back to the plant. And I use the part is to look at the way the plant responds chemically to deter those herbivores. The results show that plants ignore vibrations created by non-threatening insects and environmental factors like wind, while turning on defenses when the vibrational sound of chewing happens. That's pretty smart for a plant, it knows the difference. <clears throat> Plants make poison to kill insects. But it turns out that the wild tobacco has a secret chemical weapon to deploy. As soon as an herbivore attacks, it ramps up a toxin, one that some of us are all too familiar with. It's a volatile a toxin that will poison any organism that has a muscle. And that is this, this molecule called nicotine, one that human beings have such a relationship with it. So anything that moves um, and wants to eat this plant is going to be poisoned by this thing. So let's inhale that, right? Okay. <laughs> Plants call insects to eat caterpillars. <clears throat> In fact, the hornworm caterpillar can mow down a tobacco plant in a matter of days. But this cunning little plant has a few more defensive tricks up its leaves. Once the caterpillar starts feeding, the plant's leaves release an SOS, chemical messages that drift up into the air where they're picked up by the enemies of their enemies, predators that just love feasting on caterpillars. That's pretty smart. Like, how, how did they know they needed that if it was evolution? How did it know even what it was going to send out was going to call its enemy's enemy? How does it know this? Like, why would it even develop that? Why wouldn't it just die? Like, as soon as it started getting eaten, why wouldn't it just death happen to it? The insect eats it, and that's that. Yet it sends out a, a scent that calls its enemy's enemies to kill the thing that's harming it. Now, that's design when you look at something that complex. That can't be anything other than design. <clears throat> so the wild tobacco plant recognizes different insects by their chemicals. But wait a minute. How does the plant even know who's attacking it, let alone which predator to call in? Well, the answer lies in yet another chemical message. This one delivered by the caterpillar itself. When the caterpillar chews on the plant, it has to have saliva in its mouth. And the, in that saliva, there are these various compounds that provide information to the, to the plant. And the plant uses those compounds to say, ah, it is the hawk moth and not a negro bug that's feeding on me. And so it adjusts and tunes its responses to that particular herbivore. It's pretty interesting. I mean, that's design right there. Like, how does it know? Why did it know it needed that? <clears throat> so a plant makes deadly lollipops. And Baldwin has discovered that this plant has another secret weapon, specifically designed to rid itself of caterpillars. This is a trichome, a sweet little treat deposited by the plant 
and irresistible to caterpillars. Beautiful, yes, but it's as lethal as a landmine. When this little guy chows down on a tricone, it gets a very bad case of body odor. Twenty minutes after eating the tricone, they're smelling it. So what we've learned from these particular smells is that they inform predators, particularly ground foraging predators. The plant is offering this nice little sugary first meal for the caterpillars, but it's an evil lollipop because the caterpillar gets tagged for predation. It's the razor blade in the apple yeah. at Halloween time. Sets it up to <laughs> call its enemy there. <clears throat> So how does it know it needed to develop that? How did it know that that one plant, how did it know it needed those things? That's design. That's so complex. I mean, think about how do you know, like if you need to call the police if something's happening at your home or if it's just, you know, someone friendly. Like we have intelligence to know something like that, right? So we know based on who's out there, right? What time it is. We can figure these things out. So how does this plant know Oh, you know, this is this type of enemy. This is this type of enemy. Here's the scent I need to, to put off. How does it know? Through intelligence. And it's programmed into it by an intelligent designer. Or we'd say God. God created it. This is how God made it. <clears throat> so evolution is disproved by the fact that life appears in all of its amazing complexity from the very beginning. It doesn't, you know, it didn't start off a single cell. It starts off, everything starts off complex. Even that so-called single cell is not simple. All right, the fossil record exhibits stability or stasis. Creatures not only appear in the fossil record fully formed, but they also retain the same form and habits over supposed millions and hundreds of millions of years. Uh, Stephen Stanley, Johns Hopkins University, an evolutionist, said this, I have demonstrated a biological stability for species of animals and plants that I think would have shocked Darwin. Something tends to prevent the wholesale restructuring of species. Look at that last part. Something tends to prevent the wholesale restructuring of species. Like what keeps these people believing in evolution? When their own understanding, their own observation says the exact opposite, yet they continue to believe in evolution. He just said in that statement, something tends to prevent the, whole, the wholesale restructuring of species. He says evolution doesn't happen. He just said that, but yet he'll, he'll still continue following, believing in evolution. So many do, even though all the evidence points against it. Everything that they're seeing is pointing against it. <clears throat> what is it? And I always go back to this. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It always comes down to the flesh. And well, if, if evolution is not true, then the possibility that God exists is true. Not even that the God of the Bible is true. It's just the possibility of God is true. And now... I'm accountable to that. And again, that's not in every single case, but that's going to be, you know, why men go after things, why they reject the truth of God. Stephen Jay Gould, an evolutionist, he says, most species exhibit no directional change during their tenure on earth. So then how did they evolve? How did they evolve? How did they ever get to the next stage? <clears throat> Frank's statements like these by Dr. Gould are censored for school materials. Luther Sunderland, Darwin's Enigma. So they're censored for school materials. They're not going to put this in it because that goes against the narrative that they want to push in teaching evolution. It would just confuse kids, right? Or have the kids questioning, be like, well, then if this is true, then where did we come from? Right? Isn't that a logical conclusion? That's a fair question to ask. I think all of us have, have thought of that. I remember thinking that when I was a little kid. I'm like, where do we come from? You know, thinking these things. I mean. Children, you know, are, are very intelligent. <clears throat> the bat. A fossil bat dated at 50 million years old, which, you know, there's that. <clears throat> That's just, anyway, the dating methods are, are a mess, but anyway. A fossil bat dated at 50 million years old is on display at the Museum of Natural History at Princeton, and it looks the same as the modern bat. It's 50 million years old. There's been no change in that 50 million years of... I thought this is what you guys are claiming is that there's all this change taking place yet. I mean, this is the evidence we're looking at 50 million years ago. Look at this bat. It's the same as a bat today. And they don't recognize that. The Burke Museum of Natural History in Seattle has a display of supposed 50 million year old
fossilized leaves of cedar, pine, ginkgo, birch, and redwood, and they look exactly like the modern varieties. Interesting. There's been no change. The stability of creatures disproves Darwinism. They just stay the same. Okay, if evolution is true, living things would continue to change. And again, you know, they're gonna what they're gonna use to to prove evolution is they're gonna use microevolution, just changes within a kind. Okay, and just us sitting right here, you can see changes amongst all of us. We're all different. We all look different, have different sized noses, different heights, different skin color. You know, everything about us is different. Our noses are different, our ears are different, our the shape of our face is different, our lips are different, everything's different about us, but at the same time, everything's the same. Right? There's change within a kind, but it never moves from this kind to something else. That does not happen. That's never been observed. So they use what's observable, which we accept, a change within a kind. I mean, God created them after their own kind, right? You say, well, how did all the dogs in the world get here from just two dogs if Noah's Ark is true? Well, you think everything got here from one simple cell. Why is that hard for you to believe that all these different varieties of dogs came from two dogs? And then when you get mankind in there trying to change things like breed certain dogs with certain characteristics, it, it's still something that all the information was already there. It's just a change within that kind. That's what's observable. That's what we see. But you don't ever get a non-dog from two dogs, ever. You never get a non-dog from two dogs. <clears throat> So this stability of creatures disproves Darwinism, and if evolution is true, living things would continue to change. Six, the uniformitarian view is now rejected even by evolutionists. Charles Lyell said the geological layers were laid down over millions of years of gradual buildup. He said the past is the key to the present, meaning that conditions have remained the same over millions of years of time. This is called uniformitarianism. So nothing's ever changed, essentially. Today, this theory is being rejected by the evidence that things formerly thought to have required millions of years can actually occur very quickly. Some geologists are calling themselves neo-catastrophists. What does that mean, a neo-catastrophist? Catastrophe, a new catastrophe, right? Neo-catastrophe. What they don't want to say is the flood. That's a catastrophe, right? A worldwide flood's a catastrophe, right? If that happened right now, we'd be like, this is catastrophic, this is bad, okay? <clears throat> so that's what they're calling themselves now. They believe that many of the fossil rocks were laid down by massive, oh, there it is, local floods, local floods, all right? And you have some, in order to fit the Bible with so-called science, you've got a lot of Christians that are fall in line with this, and that they'll believe the millions of years and all of that, and they'll say, oh, the flood was local. I'm like, well, when you read it, it's, it's, it's like, I forget how many feet it is above uh, or cubits is the term that's used, how many cubits it is above the tallest mountain in the world. It's that high. So like, okay, let's say, you know, the, 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 the top of the mountain's right here and tallest mountain in the world, top of the mountain's right here and the water is, is this high above it. So this side's all flooded within this valley here, but it doesn't, it goes this high above it, but doesn't fall over to the other side. Really? I mean, it, <laughs> If that's the case, the writer of the Bible would have had to have been an idiot, right? If you've ever overfilled a cup or something, you know it doesn't just start standing up. It starts going over the edge, right? That's common sense, right? <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> you have Christians that will believe, oh, the, Noah's flood was a local flood only. I'm like, well, okay, he spent 100 years preparing for it, basically. Why didn't he just leave the area, right? Why would he go to all that trouble and not just leave the area if it's just going to be a local flood? and not a worldwide flood, as the Bible says. And why is there evidence all over the world of a worldwide flood? I mean, there's been people that are here in the Sandia Mountains, you know, 10,000 feet up have found seashells. Where'd those come from? I mean, you've been in New Mexico for a while. There is no ocean around here, right? There's hardly any water around here, right? Where did that stuff come from? Unless it was a worldwide flood. So they believe the fossil rocks were laid down by massive local floods. Look, at least, like, there's some respect for that. At least it's like, okay, I, I can, you're starting to at least look at the evidence that's there and say, hold on, wait, well, we've been 
believing it doesn't match up with this. There, there's at least some respect for, for them to take that step. In fact, the current evolutionary theory is that the Earth has witnessed a series of global catastrophes. The Chicago Field Museum describes six mass extinctions that were supposedly caused by shifting continents, volcanic activity, meteors, etc. But they won't admit that there was a global flood because they don't want to believe the Bible. Right? There it is. That's what it comes down to. Number seven, the uniformitarian view was disproven by Mount St. Helens. The Mount St. Helens volcano explosion has proven that geological layers can be formed in hours and days. Mount St. Helens is located in Washington State in the northwest part of America. This is what Mount St. Helens looked like before the explosion. Take a look. I'll, I'll come back to this. Look at it. May 18th, 1980, the mountain exploded. The entire northern face was blasted away. Look at that thing, man. That's a big explosion, right? I mean, that's a lot of dirt to move. I mean, when you look at it, I know there was reports of some of the ash and stuff was coming all the way here to New Mexico. It was falling here, probably farther. You know, I mean, this was huge. So look at it. That's what it was. So it got blown away, too. That's incredible. Canyons up to 140 feet deep and several miles long were carved into solid bedrock in places. This was caused by fast-flowing water and mud. Look at that. Look at the layers, right? These rock layers were formed in a short time. This proves that layers of sediment can be laid down quickly and that great canyons such as the Grand Canyon can form quickly. You know, there's some, like again, the, the flood explains pretty much everything. That you're like, how did that happen? How did that happen? The flood. Noah's flood. And, and this is a rabbit hole you can get in. If you can get it, like when I recommend people or things, it doesn't mean I agree with everything that they teach, okay? But you can get some excellent information from Kent Hovind. If you look up, he did a, a series of lectures. They're like two hours long each, but it's a ton of good information. I think it's like one through nine or one through eight, something like that. And he hits on all of these and he gives so, some of his own theories as to what happened, but he goes into detail of how like all of this stuff took place. Highly recommend it. Look it up on YouTube. Um, I forget what they are called, but if you start looking it up, I can find it for you and let you know. So number eight, the fossil record contains evidence of the global flood described in the Bible. The global flood explains the layers of sedimentary rock throughout the world. Sedimentary rock is formed by moving water. The sedimentary <clears throat> rock layer, the sedimentary rock layers are hundreds of feet deep and miles long. Ordovician Sum Shale in South Africa is 30 feet thick and stretches hundreds of miles. The Devonian Thunder Bay formation in Michigan is 12 feet thick and stretches for hundreds of miles. The Sewalki Hills in India is 2,000 to 3,000 feet high and several hundred miles long. The Morrison Formation covers an area of about a million square miles in 13 states in America and three Canadian provinces, from Manitoba to Arizona, from Alberta to Texas. Like that's 3,000 square miles? It's a lot of space. The Green River Formation covers a large territory in Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. There's a thick layer of water laid, white chalky rock that runs from America to Eastern Europe. That's crazy and the Middle East, the white cliffs of Dover are a part of this rock layer that covers two continents. The global flood explains the massive fossil beds, Agate Fossil National Park in the United States. The fossil beds are vast graveyards of dead animals that were quickly buried and fossilized. So they're still there. The fossilization that we see in the great fossil beds throughout the earth could not possibly be explained in evolutionary terms. No, it can't. Because if they just died, they'd rot away, right? I mean, if you just drive the highway, you'll see, you know, like carrion birds that are there to eat the, the animals that get hit, right? They clean it up. God designed it like that. There's those birds that are going to take care of us. So you don't have rotting flesh everywhere. They're going to eat it. So it's not an awful thing. So if these just die, something's going to eat them and take care of them. But here they are fossilized, fully formed. Fossil beds do not form under normal conditions. Dead animals are quickly consumed by animals, insects, worms, and bacteria and are destroyed by the action of the environment, sun, rain, wind, moving water, etc. This is true even for giant whales. The BBC video Blue Ocean shows a dead whale being devoured by fish, worms, and bacteria at the bottom of the sea. 
There are special worms in the deep sea that use acid to eat through the bones of dead whales. They were first discovered on a whale carcass in 2002. The vast herds of millions of bison that were killed in the late 19th century on the western plains of America left no fossil evidence. The lions that infested Israel for centuries and that are mentioned 141 times in the Old Testament have left no fossilized remains. 2 Kings 17, 25, Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. I'm glad we don't live somewhere where there's lions like that. I'm just if, have, you, have you ever seen in person, like face to face, a mountain lion? No? Like in the zoo, I've never run into one in the wild, don't want to. But I have at, at, at the zoo, there's, what is it, the Wildlife West Nature Park in the East Mountains there. They used to have two mountain lions. One of them was raised in captivity. Its mother, I think, was killed when it was a baby, and that was the male. And then there was a female that like got injured. Uh, she grew up in the wild, got injured, and then they had to bring her there. And, man, that female looked ferocious. I mean, the male looked like a like a zoo lion that they just like lay there and they're kind of get fat and lazy and they just sit there. He was like just nice and chilled, relaxed. The female that grew up in the wild was like walking like back and forth, prowling is what it looked like. I mean, she was stronger looking than him. Like she was like buff. I mean, just like walking around. She was just like, <sighs> like as you're looking up at her, I mean, she was like mad looking like ferocious and they're smaller than those lions. I would hate to live somewhere where there's lions like that. Okay, anyway, this exposes another myth in the natural history museums. The Chicago Field Museum. Fossilization occurs naturally when dead creatures soak in groundwater for a long, long time. All right, now, this is what they're going to give to children. Why wouldn't a five, six, seven, eight-year-old believe that? Why wouldn't they? Right, of course they're going to. Of course they're going to believe them. Because children just naturally trust adults, right? They're not going to lie to me. They're going to give me good information. And then it's further reinforced. The more they go through school and the more they hear this stuff and they show them these things, even though they don't show them the truth, right? They said they're not putting this, that we don't see any transitions taking place while anything's alive. Stephen Gould said that, right? They don't put that in the textbooks, but they do put stuff like this, or they'll take them to, to these museums and show them these things. Right? Oh, it just occurs naturally when dead creatures soak in groundwater for a long, long time. My science book told me that. Science says that. Right? The British Museum of Natural History. Fishy death. So this is at the British Museum of Natural History. The fossils in this slab belong to a school of fish that died in the same place at the same time. Their lake dried out during a hot spell, leaving the trapped fish to die. That's what it says right there. About, look how long ago that was, 370 million years old. How in the world do they know that's what happened? Right? How do they know? The British Museum of Natural History. When the fish dies, it falls to the sea floor and becomes buried in sediment. The soft body parts rot away, leaving the hard bones. Sediment layers accumulate and become compacted over time, forming a rock mold around the skeleton. The skeleton is gradually replaced by other minerals. All right, these are unscientific statements. Fossilization does not naturally occur in this manner. When a fish dies, it is quickly devoured by animals and eaten by germs. And there's a dry fossil bed. Look, they didn't soak in and become fossils, right? It didn't happen. When a clam dies, it opens up. That's important to note, okay? Remember that. When a clam dies, it opens up. But fossil graveyards contain millions of clams that are closed. This means that they were fossilized rapidly. Why would they stay closed and die? The flood, right? What happened? They were buried. They were buried. That's what happened. Coal deposits contain the fossils of perfectly preserved skeletons of large dinosaurs, which would have had to have been covered almost instantly. Otherwise, the bones would have disappeared or be scattered. Okay, if you've ever been walking through the mountains and you, you find like a deer or something that's there, it is, you might find a body and it's been partially eaten or whatever, and, and maybe it's old and dried and starting to rot and everything, and you'll see bones are usually missing. Stuff's taken away because animals came and ate it. And, the stuff just gets scattered, and after a while, the sun just beats on it. It'll just turn to dust. <clears throat> okay. Here is a seven-foot uh, ichthyosaur that was fossilized while giving birth. Look at that. Did they die and slowly sink into the sediment? I mean, come on. How did that happen? They were instantly buried. What explains that? A flood, right? A flood explains that. 
Fossil graveyards contain millions of soft-bodied organisms, including bacteria, embryos, leaves, flowers, worms, jellyfish, fish eggs, and insects, including butterflies. Fossil graveyards contain soft-bodied organisms. This is impossible under normal circumstances. Such things don't fossilize, they disappear quickly after death. Food can be seen in the guts of fossilized fish. There are fossilized scorpions with their stings preserved. There are fish with embryos inside their abdomens. Triassic cow brand formation in Virginia. Microscopic details are preserved at a res resolution of approximately one micron. This is 25 times smaller than we can see with our eyes. Cretaceous Santana formation in Brazil. Skin, scales, muscle, fiber, and gills with arteries and veins are visible. In one female specimen, the ovaries are preserved with developing eggs inside. Lignite beds of Gieseltal in Germany. Leaves have been so well preserved that alpha and beta types of chlorophyll can be recognized. The color of the leaves has been preserved. Fish swallowing another fish. How did that happen? I'm just going about my life, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> floods taking place. You don't know it. You're a fish, right? And then all of a sudden, you're just buried in this mud that came down. That's it. You're done. I was getting lunch, and that's what happened. Trilobites have been fossilized in great detail. The trilobite eye, the trilobites compound eye has been fossilized in such detail that scientists have been able to study it microscopically. The fossils that are found all over the earth are evidence of a global flood that covered creatures quickly and preserved them. Global flood explains the sorting. Let's see, we'll pick up with that next week, okay?